One of the major themes of the new po uh, post-2015 development agenda, which is otherwise known as the Sustainable Development Goals, is to leave no one behind. And for this to become a reality, um, it's going to be necessary to mainstream disability into all development planning, which is what the, the UN has, has itself a acknowledged. Um, and this is because disabled people who form one of the world's largest or the world's largest minority group uh, often have been left behind in development um, due to a failure on the part of development planners and practitioners uh, to pay sufficient attention to the needs and, and priorities of disabled people. Why is the social model of disability important? Um, the social model is very important because it locates disability firmly within society rather than within the individual body. So impairment is a prerequisite for disability within the social model, but disability itself arises from a, a whole range of disabling barriers, such as inaccessible infrastructure, stigma, negative beliefs, discriminatory processes. And these barriers combine to, to reinforce the exclusion of people with impairments from society. Um, the social models played a really vitally important role in encouraging disabled people around the world to rise up and challenge society to become more accommodating. Um, and also to view the removal of disabling barriers as a rights issue rather than as an act of, of uh, charity. Um, there are, however, ongoing debates over the, the continuing relevance and applicability of, the, of this very Western-oriented model, particularly uh, in the global context. Um, and this is why I've selected the first article for the pack, which is uh, a paper by Shakespeare and Watson, uh, which argues that the, the clear line uh, within the social model drawn between impairment and disability uh, creates something of a dichotomy which tends to oversimplify the relationship between disability and impairment and sometimes underplays the disabling impact of impairment itself. And although, although this paper was written back in 2002, it's still a very relevant um, discussion paper uh, on the strengths and limitations of the social model in terms of uh, shaping our understanding of disability. Well, it's virtually undisputed that disabled people are, are overrepresented among the poor. Um, the paper in the pack by Nora Gross and colleagues looks at a, a wide range of research-based evidence on the nature of this close relationship between disability and poverty. Um, it has been viewed in the past as a vicious cycle in which disability and poverty are mutually uh, reinforcing. Uh, but it's also important to recognise the commonalities between disability and poverty. So, you know, the, ex the exclusionary processes which apply to disabled people, such as limited access to education, employment, basic health services, are often very similar to those that apply to poor people in general. Uh, and this supports one of the arguments presented in the second paper in the pack by Barnes and Sheldon, which is that the disability movement should consider forming horizontal alliances with uh, more general pro-poor social movements. Um, in order to strengthen its campaign against inequality and injustice. Uh, I have seen an example of this myself on a recent visit to the Philippines um, where I met with a very prominent disability activist who was also the president of a, an independent living centre run entirely by disabled people. And he told me how his organisation had joined a federation of civil society organisations in the Philippines called Social Watch. And as a result of forming this alliance, um, they had been able to uh, liaise very regularly with government committees on a whole range of disability issues, whereas in the past they'd only very rarely been consulted. Um, so, so forming that horizontal alliance had, had made a, a, a huge difference to their, the um, effectiveness of their advocacy work. And, being, and looking outwards from the disability movement and, and looking for the commonalities between the priorities of disabled people and those of uh, poor and marginalised people in society in general. Education plays a really important role. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crucial disability issue because despite international commitments to principles such as education for all and universal primary education, many disabled children remain excluded from education at all levels. Um, inclusive education is often put forward as the solution to this problem, um, but simply including disabled children within mainstream schools uh, won't work effectively if the schools don't have the resources to make the necessary adaptations to their buildings or to supply the necessary teaching materials and equipment in order to meet the needs of all learners. Um, another problem with um, that often arises when trying to include disabled children in mainstream schools is a lack of disability awareness within schools and also sometimes a problem with negative attitudes among teachers and even parents who don't always see the value in sending their, their disabled children to school. Uh, so the paper in the pack by um, Sean Gregg 
um, looks at some of these issues in the context of extreme poverty in rural Guatemala, and it also highlights the uh, important role that special schools continue to play in many countries despite the international drive towards inclusive education. The CRPD, or the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was enacted in 2006, is, is hugely significant uh, because it places legal obligations on the 159 states um, that have now ratified the convention to promote and protect the rights of disabled people. Uh, these are not new rights. They are, they've all been previously established in, in agreements going right back to the UN Declaration on Human Rights in 1948. But the introduction of a legally binding instrument um, creates a real opportunity for disabled people to, act, people to access these, these rights. But obviously the CRPD won't make a major difference to the lives of um, disabled people if it's not effectively implemented within nation states. And this is one of the, the issues that's looked at in the paper by Soldactic and uh, Sean Gregg. Uh, that paper also raises important questions about the language of the CRPD, uh, which very much reflects a social model view of disability, and also about its, its scope, which is limited to protecting citizen rights within nation states. So, for example, uh, could potentially fail to protect the rights of uh, disabled people living within refugee communities, for example. Well, it's widely recognised that disabled people are disp disproportionately affected by natural disasters. Uh, there's a whole range of factors that combine to reinforce the vulnerability of, di of disabled people when disasters occur, particularly in low-income countries. Uh, and that includes uh, often a lack of reliable data on the, the whereabouts, the prevalence and the specific needs of disabled people. Uh, the literature in the field reveals a general lack of inclusivity and recognition of disability rights um, within disaster planning processes. Um, and one of the, the solutions that's uh, sometimes put forward to this problem is to uh, try to facilitate the meaningful participation of disabled people within disaster planning processes. The final article in PACT by um, Priesting Hem and Hemingway, um, that's one of the articles that's made in that, uh, that's one of the arguments that's made in that uh, article. Um, it draws uh, an interesting comparison between Hurricane Tr Katrina and the Asian Tsunami. Um, and it argues that uh, disabled people's organisations in particular have a critical role to play uh, at, all, at all stages of the, of the disaster management cycle. And this argument is also reflected in the Sendai framework, which is the new international blueprint for disaster management, which was adopted at the World uh, Disaster Risk Redu Reduction Conference in Japan earlier this year. Uh, and that framework framework um, presents a much more um, rights-based, participatory and disability-inclusive approach to disaster management than its predecessor, which was the Hyogo framework. The real challenge, however, for development planners and practitioners is to turn this re rhetoric into reality by putting disability-inclusive approaches into practice in all aspects of their work, and also by um, investing in, the, in building the capacities of disabled people and the organisations that represent them um, to contribute much more effectively to their own development and empowerment. So I hope that this, this reading pack uh, will provide a helpful introduction to some of the key issues and debates in this emerging field of disability and development.